We're all fortunate to hear from, and I am privileged to moderate, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank Presidential Panel. You know, the structural debate uh, at the origin of the Federal Reserve System was intense, but whether it was genius, politics, or luck, or probably a combination of all three, the Reserve Bank approach that emerged has helped produce a financial system that has been integral to this nation's economic success. And one of the hallmarks of that system has been the quality of the Federal Reserve Bank presidents. They have produced not only astute financial, economic, and regulatory judgments, but important balance. And I think you will all see these qualities on exhibit today. I do have a series of prepared questions, but I would also invite each of our panelists to respond to, to any of the other president's comments and we'll try and reserve a few minutes for audience questions. So to begin with, uh, something on everybody's mind. Each is from a different area of the country, and could I ask that you start with some insights into how the economy is doing in your particular area of the country? And I'll just go um, that way, uh, right to left, and Ms. Okay. George. All right. Uh, well, I want to thank the Clearinghouse for uh, inviting us. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I do serve um, a region of the country that um, is quite squarely in the middle of the U.S., um, a seven-state region that is largely driven by industries like agriculture, energy, transportation, including the aerospace manufacturing industry there. And uh, that is a region of the country that is doing very well, um, but for the ag sector. Uh, we continue to see uh, in feedback from our business contacts and others in that region a fair amount of concern about shortages of labor and their ability to fill positions um, in the region to carry out manufacturing and other things. So that's become really the key issue um, in that part of the country with a very low unemployment rate right now. Energy also uh, is a big focus for us. And again, as the price of oil uh, rises and falls, so do uh, the region's uh, economy in many ways. We have seen tremendous amount of capacity come out of that region in terms of the productive capability um, of energy, and uh, we watch that very carefully. And finally, I would just say for the ag sector, again, um, a predominant focus, largely rural uh, part of the country. And for the last several years, farm incomes have been quite depressed as commodity prices have fallen. And on top of that, more recently, some of the trade issues uh, with China, which will not help um, at all. So overall, good. Some sectors like ag suffering, but um, uh, a good part of the country to try to take the pulse on how the nation's economy is doing. Okay, our Chicago district is solidly in the Midwest. We've got five states, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and, and Iowa. And so um, we've got a lot of manufacturing activity. We've got a lot of uh, automobile production, and uh, as everybody knows, General Motors made some news yesterday about uh, the closing of five uh, General Motors uh, plants. Not, um, not all of them were in our uh, district. Um, I believe I looked on the program last night. You had a speaker, the author of the book, Janesville. Janesville is exactly uh, the same type of uh, subject where there was a General Motors uh, plant and looking at uh, relocations of uh, all the auto workers. And so there are, there are definitely challenges there. But having said that, the auto sector has been strong uh, throughout the recovery. They've been an important part of uh, uh, the strength of, of our recovery. And they've sort of plateaued at this point. There seem to be more challenges. That's a big part of our district. Um, Chicago has a lot of national uh, business uh, that, that runs through Chicago, transportation, logistics, uh, corporate headquarters. And so as the US is doing, Chicago has done uh, fairly well as well. We also have heavy equipment manufacturers, um, you know, Deer, Caterpillar, uh, Cummings Engine, and others. And so they've been challenged to some extent because of the low agricultural prices that uh, Esther mentioned. And, um, and, and other things. But uh, labor is something that we hear from all of our uh, business contacts and uh, advisory council members. It's uh, difficult to come by high-skilled 
workers, the unemployment rate's 3.7%. I think that's a terrific outcome, but businesses are certainly struggling with that. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I oversee the sixth district, which is in the southeast. So that's Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Tennessee, parts of the last three. Uh, and if you look at the sixth district, it, it is basically a microcosm of the US economy. So the distribution of, of industries and sectors uh, in, the, in the sixth district almost exactly mirrors the distribution of sectors and industries in the US economy. So what you see at the US is pretty much what you're gonna see at the sixth district. Uh, and so uh, that's pretty much what's happening. The one thing I would say though is that uh, while district-wide, if you take it in the aggregate, uh, there is uh, a really positive picture of, of how the economy is performing. Um, if you did it spatially within the district, it is not evenly distributed across the entire district. So we have uh, cities that are doing extremely well. Atlanta, where we are, a lot of tech money that's starting to go there. Uh, a ton of Fortune 500 companies. I think it's the third um, uh, highest ranked city in the U.S. for Fortune 500 headquarters. Uh, you have Nashville, you have Miami, New Orleans. Those places are doing extremely well. Even places like Birmingham, which you might not think. But then if you just looked at the map, there's everywhere else. And uh, when you go to those places, so I've been to Albany, Georgia. I've been to Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Um, those places are, are having a very different experience. So, so while we have a, a large aggregate positive story to tell, there are still pockets of distress that we need to think about and be mindful of as we think about how the economy is functioning and, and how our policies should be deployed to, to make a difference there. You know, it is very interesting that you're all drawing a similar distinction uh, between areas doing well and not so well, and that was to uh, President Evans' comment, so much the subject of the talk last night by Amy Goldstein of the Janesville, very different than the bigger cities. Staying on uh, broad topics for a moment, and uh, let's move to monetary policy, and we'll go in the reverse order. And what are the principal challenges you see today about monetary policy? Are there framework changes? Are there tailoring changes which uh, could be made? Or are things just about fine? Things are great. Everything's wonderful. <laughs> don't, don't have to worry about anything. Uh, well, I mean, you heard uh, Vice Chair Clarita talk this morning about uh, some of the, the, the key metrics that we used in determining how the economy is performing uh, and how there's uncertainty around them and how they can uh, have state dependency, which is that in a particular moment in time, uh, that measure may, may move or it may change. And we've got to be mindful of that. Um, so those are things that, we're all, that we also always think about. For me, I, I'm scarred still from the Great Recession, uh, where uh, you know, the Fed, I was not there at the time, but said, you know, we don't have to worry about housing, there are no issues there, uh, we can just keep moving. And it turned out to be wrong. And so I'm, I'm trying to make sure that our team thinks hard about, well, where are those places that we should be looking that we haven't looked historically to make sure that we don't miss something? And so, uh, so for me, that one of the biggest challenges is trying to find a trend before it shows up in aggregate data. Uh, and we have a lot of staff that spend the time going and talking to people, talking to CEOs across the entire district. So we can try to identify uh, common themes that are happening in different sectors and in different parts of the, the district and, and try to put together a story to give me a sense of whether there's something going on that we're not actually seeing in numbers. And if we can get that and identify those, I feel like uh, we can make sure our policy is deployed on time. Yeah, th those are good comments. Let me build on that a little bit. We're all well aware of the national data. The national data projects strength of the U.S. economy, unemployment, 3.7%. We've got growth. Looks like it'll be over 3% this year, um, you know, looking for continued improvements. Um, and the unemployment rate with growth above trend. So with that headed to 35 and, and monetary policy, uh, readjusting something towards more uh, neutral levels. We've been providing a lot of accommodation over time. We, you know, I tend to think it's time to get back to something that's more neutral. We've gotten inflation up to 2%, and I think that that's uh, really something to uh, be happy about because we spent a lot of time below 2%. So we say that our objective is a symmetric 2% objective, so we need to, to be at 2%. But having said that, um, 
you know, we've heard a lot of commentary about tariffs, uh, trade, the uh, international environment, and so we're always looking for additional commentary from business contacts, uh, our staff uncovering things that aren't in the national data to kind of indicate, well, you know, maybe we're a lot closer to neutral than we think, or maybe we've got further to go. It sort of depends if there's more inflationary pressure. So I think that's sort of uh, some of the things that I'm thinking about. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, um, we're all interested in making sure that we follow through on the bottom line to that mandate, which is to make sure that our policy is calibrated relative to the productive capacity of the economy to continue to grow. And after having spent so many years at zero and engaging in unconventional policies, as we have gone through this process of normalizing, it's created certain challenges and things we have to be more mindful of. What does it mean as the balance sheet shrinks and what is a steady state size for that? So Raj, you mentioned how it challenges our thinking about frameworks. Um, it will require us to give thought to what kind of an operating system will we use. Will we have uh, abundant reserves? Will we go back to a scarce reserve regime? Um, so there are many things yet as consequences of uh, the crisis that we are still dealing with and we'll have to be mindful of as we go forward. So let me uh, turn to some regulatory and supervisory issues, and uh, I'd like to start with President George on this one. And there is a view uh, that the current regulatory system for community banks is misaligned uh, with their business model and uh, has become unduly burdensome. And I know this is an issue you have focused on. and. Uh, I'd like to ask, first of all, if you agree with the premise, and then to elaborate a bit, if you do, what changes could be made and should be made? So I come from a part of the country where um, there are a number of community banks. That region, uh, you will probably find 20% of the nation's uh, community banks. It has a legacy in being a unit banking state. Um, and so even with changes and a lot of consolidation, you still see a number of community banks. Having visited many of those communities in my region, um, I think uh, they do disproportionately bear burden of the current regulatory regime. And why is that? Um, I think in part because the banking system has changed dramatically over the last 30 years. Today we have a much more concentrated banking system and regulation has been focused on how to address um, those that are systemically important versus those that still operate with what I call a more traditional model, of taking in deposits and lending. And so you will find the overlay uh, of, secure, of uh, regulation over that industry to be enormous. Um, the answer to that, I think you will find the banking agencies very focused on right now. And I think there is a shared sense that something needs to be done. The question, of course, is what? How do you make sure that things like BSA and anti-money laundering have the same rigor um, and consumer protection has the same rigor? I think at the end of the day, what you want to make sure in this industry is we have a level playing field, that you have not unduly handicapped one part over another, either through your capital frameworks, uh, through liquidity requirements, through really what is a lot of process, um, and that you calibrate your supervisory framework uh, in that way too. So I'm hopeful the agencies will pay attention to that and uh, produce some meaningful uh, reg relief uh, for that segment of the banking industry. Uh, so, President Evans, I know you have spoken recently about CCPs, and um, this has been heralded by some, at least a number of years ago, that this was the answer to all the problems with clearing derivatives and taking care of other issues arising during the financial crisis. But there is a counter view that instead we are concentrating rather than diffusing risk. So and again, I know this has been a subject of uh, interest to you, and so could I ask for your views on that? Well, I, that's exactly right. I mean, if you're going to um, 
you know, direct, um, you know, more trading activity into an exchange so that, you know, they can uh, provide uh, finality to all the participants um, and then trade variation margin as the, as the positions change uh, over time as opposed to building up some, um, some surpluses or, or, or debits that uh, could be difficult to settle at a different time uh, if it's based on a AAA rating that all of a sudden changes and then there's a call for that one during a very difficult time. So I mean, the, the, the proposition is a very good one, but of course it does concentrate more activity in one place and so I think um, you know, Ben Bernanke used to uh, quote Mark, Tra Mark uh, Twain, if you're going to put all your eggs in one basket, you want to look at the basket really carefully and make sure everything's done well. And so I think that the, um, you know, the, the, the supervisory oversight of those activities is really important to make sure that uh, uh, they're very strong institutions and uh, that they can uh, be resilient and uh, handle all the challenges that they face. But I think that uh, the finality that they offer uh, people in trading uh, options and derivatives is a really very uh, valuable one. So I, I think it, I think it's a good model. So it's the model. It's but it's you've got to, as you said, you've got to make sure the basket is tight. You absolutely woven. do. Yeah, you absolutely do. And so you know, obviously, with all of the, you know, everything's digital, everything's electronic, uh, with all the cyber risks, with all the resiliency, and you've got to make sure that uh, there are backup plans and, and all of that. So it, it's a really uh, tough task. Um, it. You know, it's the other side of the community banking or the uh, previous, you know, panel where they talked about customer expectations and, you know, everybody wants something, their phone to be able to do everything for them. I can do it. You know, I could check my payment just this morning that it got there that, you know, for some reason it's going to be a check and not a digital. But, but I, I found out about that. There's a lot of overhead associated with that. Um, and, um, you know, that, that, that's a high fixed cost, and so that's going to limit uh, the size of some of these operations. That's what competition's all about, and I think everybody's got to figure out their game strategy for that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bostic, maybe it is that uh, at the president level of a reserve bank, you're a bit insulated uh, from uh, the issue I'm going to raise, but we keep hearing at least that the supervisory system continues to be overly adversarial and overly confrontational between, it's not just the Federal Reserve, it's all the federal supervisors and the banking industry. And I'm wondering if you are hearing that, if you believe it's a problem, and is there something more which could be done? So that's a, that's actually a pretty big question. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I'll just say it from the perspective that I have coming into the Sixth District. Um, through the financial crisis, the Sixth District had more bank failures than anywhere else. Right? We had more foreclosures than anywhere else. And so um, my view is that we need to be engaging more with uh, our, the banks that we oversee to make sure that they are as sensitive to risk as we are, uh, to make sure that we don't have a repeat of that experience. And whether that's considered to be adversarial or uh, uh, collegial or having a tough conversation, you know, if there are tough conversations, we probably need to have them. That's, that's our role. Um, now, there's a question of um, you know, what's an appropriate level of risk, and how do we think about this at an institutional level and at a systemic level? And that's a conversation that we need to have. I mean, we're going to have to have some, some viewpoints, and that's going to be something that we go back and forth on. And those can be collegial conversations. Those can be difficult conversations. Those can be adversarial or confrontational. You know, what I've tried to, to impress upon uh, my team is that you know, we actually have the same objective as the management of the banks that we examine. We want them to, to be successful, we want them to be around, uh, and we want there not to be significant exposures. And I think we start with that viewpoint, uh, then the conversations are, are understood in a much more um, uh, professional way, and the notion of adversarial I think starts to, to, to sort of fade away a little bit. So that's, that's how I, I kind of view it. Um, the one thing I do want to say on this is that um, another thing that my team has heard me talk about a lot is that uh, much of banking is now not happening in banks. And so the ways that we are going to interact with the non-bank sector is going to be something that's particularly important moving forward. So we know Quicken is the largest mortgage uh, originator right now. If you think about where leverage lending is happening, it's happening in, in a lot of non-bank um, areas and it's growing fast. 
so as we start to think about systemic issues and how we uh, are a steward for the financial system, I think this conversation about how do we engage in the non-bank context is gonna be more and more important. Could I just actually pick up with that? Because I agree it is a very important issue. I mean, whatever database you look at, more and more of what used to be traditional banking is occurring outside the banking system. And that's an issue of competition for the banks, but it's also an issue for the Federal Reserve. How can it implement a regulatory policy if increasingly those that it is regulated, it is regulating uh, are a shrinking piece of the pie? So what are, could I ask each of you, what are your views as to what could be done, should be done? It, systemic, you know, Congress tried to get at that, in Dodd-Frank, but it's more than just systemic. So I'm gonna start with that, Raj, because I think um, we need to remember your point about the banking system is becoming a shrinking part of our financial system in general is true. But remember the underlying premises of why banks are special um, in many respects in terms of the role they play in intermediation, the role they play in the payment system. And the fact that with being heavily regulated, they have a safety net, a safety net either uh, of deposit insurance and certainly access to the Federal Reserve's uh, liquidity facilities. So as we look at uh, what some may call encroachment on that system, competition, I don't know what you wanna call it, I think we need to be very careful and thoughtful as we think about what the consequences are to the current institutional frameworks Clearly, things need to innovate and are innovating in that space, but the underlying principles in this country that have, I think, served us well for many years in terms of what role that safety net plays, we need to be careful before we extend it ever more broadly. And I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's something that's worth uh, careful consideration before we just extend regulation and assuming assumptions about what access to the safety net there is. <clears throat> you know, I, I you know look at the uh, you know large number of new players in uh, the financial system, fintech firms, uh, and there's a lot of competition, and there's a lot of demand on the part of consumers for um, you know better applications, more access uh, to their funds and, and data, and I think that banks have been uh, very innovative over a long number of years um, in trying to deliver, but um, obviously new. Uh, competitors bring new insights and uh, things that I've learned to appreciate my, you know, children, you know, would find as minimally substandard and they want more than that. And so I think competition is a very powerful force. I think it's healthy. I think as long as we understand where the safety net is and isn't, um, you know, that's very important. There are a lot of, um, you know, I think my... Uh, I think my son has an account with uh, one of these, and you know he's got some funds built up, and they're not insured. Um, you know, and if you understand that, uh, that's okay. And as long as it doesn't go wrong, that's okay. But these are risks and everything, and so I think that everybody needs to understand that. But I think competition is very healthy. Anything more? Yes, yeah, so uh, Atlanta is trying to be uh, a fintech hub, and so I have the opportunity to go and talk to a lot of. Uh, entrepreneurs in this space. And, and one thing that I, I try to talk to them about is uh, to think about more than just your innovation. And actually to acknowledge and recognize that with innovation comes risk and comes uh, possibilities for exposures. And um, I talk to a lot of innovators in this job. Almost none of them has risk at the top of what they're thinking about. And that makes me nervous, right, in the sense that you know, we're gonna have a bunch of innovations plug into our financial system, uh, and there may not have been sufficient due diligence about well, what are all the protections you have in place to make sure that you're not exposing the whole system or major parts of the system to significant risk. So I'm trying to have that conversation uh, to make sure that, that they know that um, we care about this, and uh, the more prominent they get, the more they're going to have to come up against this. So if we can get that done in advance, I think that's a good thing. Um, a second thing that, that I've been doing uh, and trying to do with, with um, my, the banks I, bankers I talk to is say, look, you guys tell me all the time it's not a level playing field. How would you design a regulatory structure? It'd be incredibly helpful to have 
sort of an industry view on what an appropriate regulatory structure would look like, that could be the basis for a conversation around this to try to see if we can move to a different kind of approach. And I think that would be useful as well. And the third thing I, I worry about, and Charlie talked about this a little bit, is that with all these innovations, consumers have no idea what risks they're exposed to. So my partner loves Apple Pay. Right? So yeah, Apple Pay bumped the phone up against whatever he's doing. And, um, I love Apple Pay. You have Apple Pay too? I love Apple Pay. I, I, I'm, I'm not doing it, so I'm, I'm not doing it. So. I'll stick to credit cards and cash, and that'll be good. You're right? going uh, to be getting a call soon. <laughs> but, but, but we know that um, like when you do a credit card, you can get, you can get your, uh, your money back or a return or all that kind of stuff. Uh, Venmo didn't have a setup for that, or Zelle didn't have a setup for that, and so they had problems. And if, if there's a problem in Apple Pay, it's not clear under some uh, arrangements you know, what's going to happen there. And consumers are not aware that the, the mode that you pay uh, Exp uh, uh, comes with different levels of responsibility and rules of the road and all that sort of stuff. And so we, we actually have uh, a challenge at the consumer level as well, so that as um, these things mature and become more robust and more widespread, everyone really understands exactly what the deal is because um, otherwise we're going to have a bunch of angry consumers uh, and then they're going to come complain to us and I'm trying to avoid that. So if I could add Please. on to that, I was struck um, listening to the last panel of bankers and how much of the conversation was consumed by talking about fintech and financial innovation. Um, and I think that's right. We've been watching for uh, more than a decade how the financial services industry is innovating and how much of that came from non-banks um, with that innovation. Uh, so much, and, and we know the states were involved, there's a regulatory framework that uh, those non-banks uh, had been subject to. So now as we contemplate a federal charter uh, for FinTech, I think it's interesting because this is now uh, raising a number of policy questions. It will raise the questions of what is a bank um, and how do we define a depository institution. Um, and I think for the Federal Reserve, uh, this will be a challenging issue. I think it will be challenging because national banks have generally been Fed members, which then provided access to the payment system through having a master account at the Fed. Um, I think we will also have to sort out what does it mean under the Bank Holding Company Act, whether these uh, charters um, are subject to that in some way. And um, so again, back to my, my point about the institutional frameworks around this. I think they require us to think carefully about what we are stepping out uh, onto in terms of innovation, in terms of providing things to the public um, and making sure that we keep in mind things like risk management that Raphael referred to and, and other things. Thank you. Um, let me continue with the theme of financial innovation, but take it in a slightly different direction. We have had for decades, forever, uh, a significant segment of the population that is either unbanked or underbanked. You see financial innovation, whether within the banking system or outside the banking system, trying to uh, mitigate at least that century old problem? So I, I think this is a complicated question. Uh, so the World Bank estimated that there are about 1.7 billion unbanked people. And of that amount, two thirds have a cell phone, right? So if, if you have that kind of penetration in the population we're trying to reach, it becomes a natural thought that you know this the app type of, of, of innovation can reach them and get them to engage in, in the banking system and the payment system um, more broadly. Uh, but then if you, you have to, it's, you get sober when you start thinking like, why don't they have bank accounts? Why are they not using banks? Um, and for many it's the fees are more than they can handle or there is uh, a minimum balance that you've got to have in these accounts to, to, try to keep them alive. Um, or they are aware that they have sufficient uncertainty and volatility in their income such that um, they're not sure that they can keep these things open on a regular basis. And those things 
have to be addressed. So, so if, if we're going to have a financial innovation that gives access to um, the, the payment system and the banking system for people who have been unbanked, it's got to grapple with these issues, with, with the causes of that. And I'm not, I'm not sure there are easy answers there. And that, that's, kind, that, that's kind of where I go on both sides. For some segment, it probably, like in the US, we know that um, what 50% of the unbanked had a bank account at some point. So it's not that they don't want to have a banking account, it's that circumstances have not really worked for them. And so we've got to find ways to make the circumstances work, uh, perhaps by going to an app world and your overhead costs go down, and so the fee structure changes in a fundamental way to make things more accessible. But these are all things that are, are uh, unproven today. So can I just add Please. to that? I think as we've looked at uh, faster payments in the U.S. and ways to modernize, um, this has been in focus to think about what benefits could accrue to the unbanked and underbanked. But as Raphael said, there are a variety of reasons why individuals find themselves um, without bank accounts or not utilizing them. So it will not be, I think, the silver bullet to that. On the other hand, um, if we think about equitable access and ways for people to have that opportunity, surely I think it has some benefits uh, that could derive from that. When you think about the cost, um, fees, often how uh, people manage their money can result in fees. This may be a way um, with real-time payments to uh, minimize some of that. So I think it does have opportunity. Uh, for that segment uh, of the population that currently underutilizes banking services uh, going forward. I, I think these are great issues. I think uh, it's, it, it is a very compelling observation when you read, find out that people who don't have a bank account previously had a bank account, but then they had an unhappy experience with uh, fees that uh, overdraft and then additional charges after that and they just can't uh, it, it you know ends up being four or five hundred dollars perhaps and uh, they, they didn't have that you marry that with this observation about so many people who have cell phones around the world I actually haven't read this but it must be the case that they prepay that phone they don't have an account that's going to allow them to charge three hundred dollars and then not pay up or something and so they're already in this you know pay at a window kind of world. So um, I think everybody understanding the market that they're facing, um, you know, banks, I heard uh, one of the previous panelists mention uh, uh, electronic services, you know, we know it's going to have to be free, checks are free, nothing is free, it's got to be made up somewhere else, and a lot of this is about where the other fees are going to be and who's going to be cross-subsidizing or redistributing and things like that. So it's a, it's a difficult business proposition, and it's what competition is going to be about. So, uh, President George, you uh, just referred to real-time payment, mm -hmm. and uh, of course this is a, a very major issue for the clearinghouse, and uh, last month the Fed released uh, a notice that is seeking public input on actions the Fed could take to facilitate real-time payment. Uh, could you give some background in your views on where you think the Federal Reserve is going? Because I fully agree, this is a, maybe not the only, it's far from the only, but it is certainly a key element of serving the unbanked and underbanked. Yeah, no, I think so. So the, the uh, Federal Reserve uh, several weeks ago issued for public comment a Federal Register notice uh, that really builds on work that has been taking place over the last five or six years uh, with the industry, including the Clearinghouse, an important participant in this discussion, um, about how the U.S. payment system should be modernized. And we convened uh, because we do not have a central authority over payments in the United States, but used the authorities we have, which are largely uh, a convener, uh, we have a role as an operator, in some cases as a regulator, but really built on, um, I think, 105 years of engagement with the banking industry and more broadly around how the payment system should look in the U.S. going forward. We put together two task forces, some 300 uh, participants in that payments ecosystem, if you will, that uh, spent a lot of time and uh, a lot of back and forth on what would be the benefits, how would this unfold, how would the market look, 
uh, in going forward around uh, real-time payments. And I think those task forces, one focused on this idea of a rail that would deliver faster payments, the other thinking about the security aspects of that, uh, really settled in thinking about um, the U.S. needing to move forward with real-time payments. And I think there was broad consensus around that. In fact, the report that came out of that Faster Payments Task Force uh, about a year ago um, highlighted really how the task force saw those issues. And out of that, pointed to the Federal Reserve to really get clarity around what role the Federal Reserve would play. One of the things out of that task force report was the value they saw in real-time settlement, 24 by 7 by 365, and asked the Fed to assess what role it should play in all of that. And for the last year, we have really been thinking about what role does the central bank have in this space, how does it support the market? Um, how might the market unfold? The comment notice that um, closes December 14th. I'll do a little ad here. Hopefully we get uh, plenty of comments. You can go out to uh, the Fed's website and see those as they come in real time. But it's really a question around a couple of things. One is, does the public see real-time payments as the future for the country? And secondly, uh, thinking about how that would unfold. Does that require real-time gross settlement provided by the Federal Reserve? Would that require uh, a liquidity management tool to make sure that uh, that kind of real-time uh, provision of payments uh, can be managed across master accounts um, held at the Federal Reserve? So this is really an important context uh, for the Federal Reserve to understand how the public sees these issues and how we should then step back and think about a going forward posture, um, whether that is something the Federal Reserve should provide. Our goal, remember, as it has been for uh, many decades, is to make sure that we have an efficient payment system, to make sure there is equitable access to that payment system, and to make sure it's safe. So those will really be the guiding principles as they have been. Obviously, we have a legal framework, the Monetary Control Act to work through, uh, but we really want to understand how the Federal Reserve could facilitate the private sector's delivery um, of faster uh, payments through the role that it plays. So please send your comments. So uh, one innovation is that the questions now come on the iPad, so you don't have to go around looking for the microphone, and then whoever <laughs> has the microphone, it never works when they bring it to the questioner. <laughs> so two of these have come in uh, directly uh, in response to that answer. I think the first is uh, almost rhetorical, I, at least I hope, and that is wouldn't uh, real-time payments lower the incidence of overdraft and the need for payday lending, and therefore respond to some of the comments that all three of our panelists have made. Uh, yeah, you know, I think it depends on the platform, obviously, and, and how it's going to be used. And so if it's somebody who's got a bank account, uh, you know, you can you know, certainly imagine that. If it's somebody who you know, has a phone, they don't have a bank account, but they're somehow wanting to make a payment, I'm not quite you know, sure how that plays out. I, I thought that, um, you know, again, I thought the previous panel was terrific. Um, the, the comment about uh, one of the CEOs had hired a full-time senior person to talk to her about the customer experience. Uh, and we've got somebody in our bank that's, you know, curating websites and the customer experience, and it's very different than my experience. It's, you know, Esther's and Raphael's and my son and my daughter and, and other people, and we all have different preferences. And so I think this real-time payment system, you know, if, if this is the academic side of me, if I could sort of start from scratch and at the public level, what is it that would be best for everybody, the entire consumer experience that would solve some of the problems that, that they're having at different income levels, uh, different, different wealth that they, they have. And um, it's very difficult to see exactly how these things will play out. It's often the case that once somebody has a platform, they're the dominant platform, and then that stays unchallenged for a long period of time until or unless somebody else can sort of challenge that model, 
easily. I think back to Microsoft when all of a sudden they won and uh, Netscape disappeared back in the late 90s and they had Internet Explorer and that was the best browser you were gonna get and they didn't put any effort into uh, updating it. But then eventually others came, there was competition and so what is it that would lead to the best type of competition so we uh, understand how consumers are served best. I think Esther ran a, uh, uh, a program where we got a lot of uh, uh, input from the industry, many different people, and so that's how we're trying to respond to and this. Consumer, I'm optimistic. Consumer groups too, so sure. this idea that it would be helpful there, but I would also say uh, we heard from small businesses that real-time payments would be helpful to them in terms of their cash flow, in terms of how uh, the information that might flow through the clearing and settlement of faster payments could help them depend less on check um, and use other uh, more digitized payment forms going forward. So that too, I think, uh, came through in that task force. Dr. Bostic, any views? You can call me Raphael. So my, my guys know I don't do the doctor thing. So, uh, <laughs> but but uh, this is a hard one, right? So the whole model of payday lending is you have someone that has uh, uh, some value on a piece of paper that they can't monetize, right? And so they go to someone to play that role. Um, that's kind of outside the payment system altogether. There, like, there, there are no payments happening there. And so, you know, it, it, but it does create opportunities. So I agree with Charlie. So, uh, you know, I, I remember when I was a graduate student, it's not on payments, but when I was a, a graduate student, um, I always liked urban economics. So I went to a, uh, a job interview and the professor I'm talking to says, well, why are you working on urban economics? Cities are going away. Right? There's, no, there's no cost for communication. Like the whole theory of a city was that you needed to be close to people to talk to them and work with them. And, and as soon as you could do email, you didn't need to live next to someone anymore. But, but what, what we didn't understand and what he didn't appreciate was that people are creative, right? And they, they take a context and they do things that no one would have thought of before and create new reasons for things to exist and new ways for people to do things. And I think that, that by adding this new technology, it, it creates an opportunity to rethink a lot of these relationships and perhaps have particular business models not be the only way to provide that service and, may, and maybe even not be the optimal way to do it. So you could see that disappear over time. The other question on this topic, I think, may go to demonstrate that the uh, drafters of that notice accomplished, and I really mean this as a compliment, uh, what they should have, which is to let various people read it in various different ways. And that would, of course, lead to comments. Also, people could uh, see their fears realized. So the question is, and President George mentioned I, the word convener and private sector, but the question is whether uh, the notice also does not contemplate the idea of the Federal Reserve's own rail in competition with the uh, private sector. And uh, you may not want to comment on whether it, com it contemplated it or not, but whether it did or didn't, uh, views that any of the three of you would have on a Federal Reserve uh, rail. Okay, I'll start. You two, uh, you're, you're the <laughs> feel boss. free to offer your, your views here. Um, so when I think about uh, the, the, whether the Fed should be an operator in this space, I really just think about the history of what role the central bank has played, what role the regional Feds have played, uh, really since our founding. Uh, that involved an important role in uh, facilitating payments. And that, of course, has evolved over the years. That has required us to uh, find ways to fairly compete under the Monetary Control Act. It is, we've seen a lot of changes in the industry. Um, I like to think we've played a role in helping promote efficiency in that payment system and innovation. I think about Check 21. The idea of digitizing that paper uh, to make uh, payments more efficient. Um, so I think there is every reason that we saw in that task force report um, a question about what role the Federal Reserve should play. And of course, we've made no decisions. We really are asking the public to help us sort through what is, what is your forecast for how the market could evolve. 
But I do think we will be informed by the role that we have played historically. And the question will be, does that apply today? Does that apply around this rail? We haven't looked at an issue like this in, what, some four decades um, since this has been uh, in the fore. But um, when I look at that history, I think there has been an important uh, role for the Fed. We have seen that uh, confirmed. Uh, the Government Accountability Office uh, asked this question in the last couple of years about what has been the effect of the Fed engaging in that payment system. And I think while there were some that disagreed, I think on the whole it pointed to innovation, that the consumer had benefited, that more innovation and market share had gone to the private sector during that time. So um, again, I don't know where we'll come out on this, and when I say we, I mean the Board of Governors. Uh, but um, I think if you look at the history, um, I can see why the task force pointed to the Federal Reserve and asked us to address this question. It's very well said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let me change subjects just a bit. Uh, I don't want to let this, uh, the time expire without mentioning the Community Reinvestment Act. I think there is close to unanimous, uh, a, a unanimous view that CRA needs reform. It's been around a long time. Very little has been done to change it. The world has changed a lot. Um, I'd like to ask uh, for your views on that possibility. And one specific, uh, Dr. Bostic had suggested building runways to uh, broaden investment opportunities in the distressed areas of our cities, and I'd be interested to hear a bit more of elaboration, a bit more elaboration on that idea as well. Sure, happy to talk about that. So, so I agree that CRA needs to be reformed. It needs to be updated. So, when it was passed in, 19, in the 1970s, uh, bank branches were the main way that people did banking. Right. So, it was natural that a branch would be uh, the ba the foundation for how you assess bank performance and the, the geographic scope and all that kind of stuff. Uh, usually when I go out and talk to people, I ask how many people have been in a branch in the last month or two months or six months? And if it's more than 30%, that's a huge number of people. People are not banking um, in branches anymore. Uh, and so in that context, the CRA stuck in a, in a mode and, and, a, and a, an evaluation framework that doesn't match how people are actually experiencing the sector doesn't make sense. So I think that, that, that there definitely needs to be some rethinking about um, how we think about what a community is for a bank and how we think about who should serve that community. I think that's important. Um, the other piece that I think is really important is uh, thinking about what kind of activities are, really represent reinvestment. Right? And, and by and large, uh, the, the early framers of the, the regulation really thought about it as lending directly. You're going to do some mortgage lending, you're going to do some small business lending, you're going to do some, some, some investments, but that's going to be a secondary kind of consideration. Um, and a concern I have, and I, it's, it's become sharpened since I've been going around my district, is that in some communities, um, you don't have a lot of resources that are ready to receive the loans that would be most helpful. All right, so it may be the case that some investments that really get, get businesses and families and communities ready to be good credits um, are the, the right investments to be making. And they, to me, they need to count. Right? Things that actually prepare communities to, to um, take advantage of the, 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 the banking system and the, the services that you guys can provide is, is critical. And so thinking hard about, well, what are the set of things that we should count? How should we think about, um, maybe, maybe it's not actually things, it's categories, right? So prep, loan, you know, just equity investment, those sorts of things, to try to get to a much more comprehensive notion of what reinvestment looks like. Uh, and I think that would be, uh, be quite helpful. Um, I mean, the challenge in all these things, of course, is you know, regulators like Bright Lines, Right. This is in. Actually, you guys do too, I know. So you know, this is in, this is out. And so finding ways to articulate this in a way that it was clear ex ante that, that activities were going to, to work um, could, would be important. I mean, I think, Esther, you guys do a really interesting thing 
around the CRA in Kansas oh, City. Investment trying, connections. And investment connections, trying to partner. I mean, I maybe you should say a few things yeah. about that. No, I think to Raphael's point, we, it is time to modernize uh, the CRA and to really think about what things help communities and not. So uh, he referenced a program that we've been doing for several years in the Kansas City region, which is to bring together those that need the funding, work with them to make sure that they are in a position to understand what is required when you get that, how does the lending, uh, underwriting work and other things, to bring those that have funds to lend into the same room where it is more efficient for them, more efficient for those that need the funding. And we've had a fair amount of success in making sure that the examiners are looking at these at the same time that those that are thinking about making the investments do too. So this program, which we call Investment Connections across several of our communities in that seven state region, um, have seen a great success, I think, in connecting that. Um, I think as we go forward and contemplate, though, how you make those meaningful things, the other aspect is one you touched on, and that is our regulatory framework and our supervisory posture around things. So this is where um, I hear from some communities. I could go into this community, I know this community, I could make a loan, but here are the requirements that I am swimming against in terms of examiners coming in and saying, well, you know, I, you have to prove this, you have to have a policy of this and that. So I think both thinking about the modernization of that as well as how the supervisory framework can complement and support um, will be needed in this process. Um, you know, I learned a long time ago that the only role that's important for a moderator is to make sure you end on time. So I've got one last, <laughs> one last question, and I'm it's sort of going to bookend because we're going to go back to uh, economics and monetary policy. And it was actually the first question which came in and has several votes. And the question is, what should be the more important statistic for policymakers, that is you guys, unemployment or labor force participation, and do the two have different implications for monetary policy? Well, I, I think they're, they're, they're both very important. I mean, you know, one of the things that's so, um, you know, nice about the current environment is the labor market has been strong. We've seen strong payroll employment growth. We've seen the unemployment rate fall. It was up to, you know, above 10 percent, and it's, uh, you know, down to 3.7 percent. And you know, one of the challenges for growth going forward, we'd all love to have those 3%, 3 to 4% trend growth year after year repeated that so many people have talked about, but a big challenge there is um, there's an identity at work for long-term growth that's going to be, you know, how many more workers do you add, labor input every year, and what can they do? What's their productivity growth rate. And so on the labor force side, we've got the aging of the population. We've got reduced participation rates across a number of segments or dem uh, secular de uh, demographics at work that sort of lead us to think that trend growth is under 2%, not above 2%. And if we could get stronger labor force growth, that would be uh, wonderful. So I think that's really important. That's a longer term issue. I mean, sure, I think that there are still some people on the sidelines who can come into the workforce, but when we talk to our businesses who sort of say they're having trouble finding high-skilled workers, I don't think the ones on the sidelines are the ones with the skills that they're looking for. So I think in terms of added uh, additional wage growth, it's uh, going to have to come from somewhere else. So I think labor force growth is very important, but it's a longer-term issue beyond just uh, monetary policy. So um, I think at the moment, uh, they're both very important. And uh, the inflation rate getting back to 2%, I think, is also very important and just sort of figuring out where we're going from here. I think you, as a policymaker, you pretty quickly uh, realize that in a $20 trillion economy, um, you cannot rely on single aggregate measures, that uh, that economy changes structurally, cyclical factors. Um, so whether it's unemployment, whether it's inflation, whether it's productivity, many you, you have to look at many aspects of that uh, economy and try to gauge where is it because one statistic I think is not gonna, gonna tell you the whole story. She took what I was gonna say, but I, I would just add that um, the, the productivity piece that Charlie talked about is actually quite important in thinking about the productive capacity of the entire economy. So uh, when, we, when I think about 
how is our labor force doing? They're not being as productive as they could be if they stay where, kind of where they are. The prospects for growth moving forward become um, dampened. And so another area that I look at, and we've been looking at pretty intensively, is business investment. And our business is making investments that can improve and increase the productivity of the workforce. Because uh, that's going to, well, it's not a labor measure per se. It is a signal of what labor is likely to be able to do in the future. And it's something that we definitely want to pay close attention to. Thank you. Well, we are at the uh, 3.30 hour. And I'd like to thank all three of our uh, panelists, our presidents, for their insightful and educational uh, evaluations of these questions and responses, and it's been, I think, highly instructive for all of us. Thank you so much.